Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 2020 Minnesota Toward Zero Deaths webinar series. Yesterday included our first webinar series with lessons learned from Norway and Sweden in the morning and a legal aspects, legal aspects discussion in the afternoon. My name is Mike Hansen, and I have the privilege of serving as the director for the Department of Public Safety, Office of Traffic Safety, and I serve as one of the three co-chairs for the statewide Toward Zero Deaths program. As we get going this morning, I'd like to thank uh, our sponsors, beginning with the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, which provides a substantial amount of our funding, Minnesota Department of Health, the Minnesota Department of Public Safety, and the Minnesota Department of Transportation. I use this picture to illustrate a couple of things. Number one, in the 17 years that TZD has been around, we've made tremendous progress in preventing serious and fatal crashes on Minnesota roads. But in spite of that progress, we have a lot of work to do. As most of you are already probably aware, uh, we are having a very difficult year on Minnesota roads where our fatalities are surging well past where they were at this time last year. 314 people have lost their lives so far on Minnesota roads. As we all know, one death is too many, but 314 is completely unacceptable and is well above what we were at this time last year. The key to identifying the tactics and strategies that we can use to prevent serious and fatal crashes uh, begins and ends with good solid crash investigations. I'm excited for today's presentation on case preparation and case reconstruction. As a former crash reconstruction specialist, I like to describe the process as putting together a jigsaw puzzle without having the, the picture to look at. You have to assemble all of your evidence and uh, in such a way that you get an accurate picture of what actually took place during a collision that resulted in those injuries or deaths. Before we kick off today's session, I would like to recognize the TZD Enforcement Star Award recipient for 2020. Payson Police Chief Josh Hansen has been a strong uh, Toward Zero Deaths program advocate and is a leader in the area of traffic safety in his city and in his region. Josh, we really appreciate everything you've done out there for all of us, and we're proud to recognize you as this year's TZD Enforcement Star Award recipient. We have a short video that we'd like to share with you from Chief Hansen. Hi, I'm Josh Hansen of the Cassin Police Department. I'd like to thank Jessica Schleck, the Southeastern Minnesota Regional TZD Coordinator for this nomination. I'm both honored and humbled to receive this award. As a police officer, I've spent my entire career trying to make our roads safer through education and enforcement. Right now, it's more important than ever to try to achieve our goal of zero deaths on Minnesota roads. Again, thank you to Jessica and the other E's in the TZD community trying to make our roads safer. And now I'd like to turn the, the uh, control over to Sergeant Tyler Millis of the Minnesota State Patrol. Sergeant Millis is going to moderate today's program and introduce, introduce our presenter. Sergeant Millis, it's all yours. I will be moderating today's webinar. My name is Tyler Millis. I am a sergeant with the Minnesota State Patrol at Minnesota's Department of Public Safety. Welcome again to today's webinar, Case Reconstruction, Building Your Case After Leaving the Scene. Before I introduce our speaker for today, I have a few housekeeping items. As a reminder, this webinar will be recorded and a link to the recording as well as the PowerPoints will be on the TZD website within a week. If you have a question for our speaker, please put it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We will get to your question at the conclusion of the presentations. If there's a question that needs immediate attention, I can interject at an appropriate time. The TZD webinar series is proud to offer continuing education credits. These listed credits are available for the for this webinar. To find the forms, please go to the case reconstruction, building your case after leaving the scene webpage. 
For our law enforcement viewers, post board credits are also available for this webinar. Please read this important announcement from the post board. If you're watching this webinar live, please watch the webinar in its entirety and the TZ, and TZD will submit the affidavit of attendance report to the post board for you. If you're watching a recorded version of this webinar, please complete the affidavit of attendance on the TZD website and email it to tzd at umn.edu. Instructions are on the web, web website if you need more details. Now on to our topic for today, case reconstruction, building your case after leaving the scene. We have one speaker today. We have Sergeant Don Egdorf. Sergeant Don Egdorf is a traffic safety liaison officer in the Traffic Enforcement Division of the Houston Police Department in Houston, Texas, and a 19 year veteran with HPD's DWI task force. He has spent 18 of those 19 years dedicated to taking impaired drivers off of Houston's roadways and specializes in working DWI related fatal crashes. Sergeant Egdorf has been a DRE instructor since 2007 and has had the opportunity to speak all over the country. He is currently serving as the vice chair of the MAD National Board of Directors. All right, thanks for having me on today. Uh, I sure appreciate it. And uh, certainly wish we were there in person uh, to do this, but uh, I think this will go pretty well. Uh, I am gonna talk kind of fast because I have a whole bunch of info and, uh, and not a lot of time. So if there's any questions, please feel free to ask and uh, I will answer anything that I can for you. <clears throat> um, when we talk about, uh, well, first, you know, one of the things I just heard talking about the, the fatal crashes in Minnesota this year, um, and the numbers. We're actually experiencing the same thing here in the state of Texas um, and the city of Houston. Uh, I think we're actually up close to 3,000 fatal crashes for the year so far. Um, over the last few years in the state, we've averaged uh, about 35, 3,600, uh, give or take. So we're also ahead of, of what we were this time last year. Uh, here in the city of Houston, we're probably going to hit about 300 fatal crashes just for the city. Uh, which is definitely up from what we've been the last couple of years as well. Uh, so it's it's kind of a strange phenomenon when you take all the COVID stuff into account, all the bars are supposed to be closed um, and, and things like that. So it's um, it, it's really been an unusual year for, for everything. Excuse me. So when we talk about reconstruction, um, you know, there's, there's multiple things for it, but you know, some of the questions are, why do we really need it? What kind of cases are we gonna do it on? Uh, what we hear from a lot of the DWI cops out there, or the patrol officers at least, is why well, I got blood, what else do I need? Um, and the real reality is that just having blood on a intox manslaughter case is not good enough. It's never going to be good enough. Um, and then the other thing we hear all the time, and the thing we have to continue getting around, and I heard it over and over and over last night doing a Citizens Police Academy class, is it's just an accident. Um, and that's really the first hurdle that, that we have to get over is to get away from that. Is it an accident or is it a crime? Uh, as investigators, if we go out to that scene and the first thing we, that we think is accident, we've already lost the battle. Um, we've got to go out there and expect that we are actually investigating a crime um, and not look at this as just something that nobody could prevent. Um, if we get through the investigation we get through all the details and we figure out, hey, this really was just an, an accident. There was no criminal act that occurred. Then great, we've done a whole lot of work to figure it out. But I'd rather have us in that situation as opposed to one where we chose not to do the investigation, chose not to look for the additional evidence, only to find out later that there really was a crime that was committed and, and we should have done more. Um, so when we talk about reconstruction, there's a few different ways to look at it. Um, so you have the crash reconstruction side of it. So that's really the how and why uh, the crash itself occurred. So that's when we're talking about vehicle dynamics. We're talking about the um, doing crush measurements. We're talking about getting all that roadway evidence to figure out exactly how those vehicles end up colliding. The next thing we go to is DRE reconstruction, uh, which is not really done all over the place. Um, it's not as widely um, used as it should be. 
but this is when you have to put together or put back together your DRE case or your DWI case. Um, the cases where your impaired driver has severe injuries. So you can't really do field sobriety tests. You can't do HGN. You can't do one leg stand, walk and turn. Uh, you can't do all the other pieces to really put it together or even get a good interview with that driver. So you really have to go back and start digging into what happened before the crash to try to figure out what was going on with that guy. Um, and when we put that whole package together, we call it case reconstruction. We're building the entire case from the ground up. So uh, rather than starting at the crash scene, we want to go back. We want to go back two, three, four, six hours, uh, whatever it was, to figure out what it was that led up to that crash happening and got us to that point that we are. Uh, does every case need, need reconstruction? Absolutely not. Um, but we get quite a bit of this. You know, we have so many cases here in Houston. And we try to explain to our prosecutors, we can't reconstruct every single case. Um, number one, we don't have the time or manpower for it, uh, mainly because we have so many of these fatal crash cases. Uh, last week, uh, just within, within the last week, I think we've had five intox manslaughter cases. Um, a couple of those are going to need reconstructions, case reconstruction done or DRE reconstructions. Uh, some of them won't. We'll do a crash reconstruction for every one of them, like we always do but they don't always need the additional work for us to get that extra info. Um, this is a case where uh, we ended up doing a, a, a reconstruction. It was not an impaired driving case, uh, but certainly was a case that needed a lot of extra work. Um, these are two young high school kids. Uh, they are both se were both seniors in high school at the time, leave the school and they decide it's a good day to, to go out for a street race. So this is part of the video that we put together uh, as part of that case reconstruction. The camera view you're looking at is a view from uh, exactly where the complainant's vehicle sat. And that white Tahoe you just saw come across there is doing 92 miles an hour. Uh, the speed limit in that area is 40. And at the time of day when this crash happened, it was a school zone. So part of that is just being able to show the jury what the speed looked like. So we have side-by-side -side runs. Uh, we had multiple runs where a vehicle is doing 40, then we have the vehicle come in 92, just to show the difference. Where somebody's sitting at that intersection, if you look up, even if you see a vehicle that's starting to crest that overpass, at 40 miles an hour, you still have plenty of time to make it through the intersection, make your turn, and you're already in the opposite direction. Um, the photo that we're seeing here is another part of the reconstruction that we did where we actually went out to the storage lot and took those two vehicles and put them back together in that position that they were in when the crash actually occurred. So looking at that minivan, it's a tremendous amount of damage. It was about 60 inches of crush damage uh, on the driver's side of that vehicle. Driver's seat ends up on top of the passenger seat and you can really describe it, but it doesn't do the same as having a picture like this to show or the overhead picture that we took when we brought the fire department out with the ladder truck to, to put that together. And we took the additional step on this case of actually bringing that minivan down to the courthouse. So when we were in trial, the judge, jury, defense, everybody had an opportunity to go downstairs and actually look at this vehicle, walk around that vehicle and see the amount of damage on it. So when the defense is trying to claim, yeah, we weren't really going that fast, even though we have a download that shows 90 plus miles an hour, we've got a reconstruction that shows 90 plus miles an hour. Um, looking at that vehicle, you know, without a doubt, that it was an extremely high speed impact um, and helped us secure a conviction on that case. But when we talk about that reconstruction, it's really about doing the extra work to get it right. Um, and it's not something that's always an easy uh, hurdle to get over. Um, you know, as, as cops, uh, you know, sometimes you want to take the easy way out, and I've been guilty of it myself. Um, as prosecutors that are looking at these cases, they want us to do all the extra stuff to, uh, to make it happen, and they want that case wrapped up in a nice tight bow, which is what we should be given to them uh, for the most part. We can't always, but we need to try. So reconstruction, do that extra work, make sure we get that case right, and make the right decision, whether it's to charge somebody or to not charge somebody. Um, this is a woman named Edwanda Caesar, and uh, this was a very, very unusual case for us. Um, Fourth of July, a few years back, uh, Edwanda and her boyfriend are leaving a party over in Southwest Houston. Um, they go out and get in her car. Edwanda's in a passenger seat, boyfriend's in a driver's seat. They take off down a road. 
within about a minute, the people at the party hear a crash. People go running down there. There's a stop sign uh, that the vehicle had gone through. There's a car that was crashed into. Two people are deceased in the other vehicle. And when all the friends from the party get there, Edwanda's in the driver's seat. The boyfriend's walking around outside. Um, she ends up being transported. She's extremely intoxicated. So was her boyfriend. Um, our officers, once they get to the scene, once they start going to the hospital, doing all the follow-ups, they start talking to her because she's taken out of the driver's seat. She tells the officer, yeah, I guess I was driving. Um, blood's drawn on her. She's charged with two counts of intox manslaughter. Um, a couple days later in court, <clears throat> what ends up happening is our prosecutor ends up looking at Wanda, who's standing over there, um, and really has one of those complete freak out moments. And if you notice the seatbelt mark that's on uh, her shoulder and her neck, it should tell you right away that we have a big problem um, with what happened in this case. So Wanda was actually the passenger in that vehicle. What we found out later was her boyfriend, uh, Wanda was actually unconscious when the crash happened or after the crash happened. Um, her boyfriend was a felon. He'd been in prison twice. He was looking at going back for a long time. So after the crash happens, he pulls her out of the passenger seat, puts her in the driver's seat and tells everybody, hey, she was driving. Um, <clears throat> because we didn't do the additional testing on him, we couldn't make the intox manslaughter case. However, we did make a manslaughter case. Um, he ended up going to prison for 40 years, uh, in part because of his actions with this, in part because he's a, a habitual offender. Um, had we not gone through and done that extra work, um, that wouldn't happen. So the questions that we get about this case a lot of times are, how did nobody notice that the night that it happened? Well, when she's transported, she's got that C collar on her neck. You really can't see the seatbelt marks. Um, and it really didn't come out for a couple of days. So uh, as soon as we noticed it, we started trying to make the right thing happen. Uh, but this was a case that uh, had we not picked up on some of those things, certainly could have gone the wrong way and potentially would put the wrong person in prison for a long time. So as we go through and we look at these events, so whether we're talking about a crash, we're talking about a traffic stop, um, whatever it's going to be, it, it's really kind of the same thing when you look at. So uh, you've got your event that happens. You've got your scene evidence that you're going to collect. So whether that's going to be roadway evidence, um, evidence from a vehicle, um, whatever we're talking about, breath or blood evidence. So we're going to have our chemical testing done. Uh, interview with the suspect that we're always going to end up doing. Um, as well as interviews with the with the witnesses at the scene. And a lot of times this is the totality of the evidence that we pick up um, on these cases. This is it. This is all we're going to end up getting. Um, but sometimes you have to start looking at things a little bit differently. So what if you go backwards? So we've got, we've got all this stuff out on the scene. We know exactly what it is. We know where it is. We know where it came from. Um, but if we start going backwards, what kind of stuff can we end up collecting? So how about a source investigation? Let's look into the location um, of where that person was drinking at. Uh, we worked a case a few years back, and I've got some photos in here about it later on. Um, but the case originated out of Minute Maid Park, where the Houston Astros play. Um, he was an Airmark employee. He was a manager over there. So he goes to the bars that he manages, and he gets free drinks all night. Um, so because of all that, because of the extra work that was done, there were actually sanctions put against the Astros, against Minute Maid Park and Airmark, um, because their actions helped lead directly to what this crash was. Um, details about alcohol, so we can find out how much they had to drink. Um, there's videos that we'll end up getting out of bars. We can actually count the number of drinks that the person has while they're at the bar, uh, which is pretty amazing. It's a whole lot more than the two beers they tell us that they always had. Um, so it ends up being, being really good for us. Uh, details about that defendant's behavior. So when they're getting in fights at the bar, they're getting kicked out of the bar, uh, they're having issues with people in there. There's other assaults that occur. There's other crimes that end up occurring that end up not being reported. We end up finding out because we're going back and doing all this extra work. Um, and then one of the big things that we get is we identify the witnesses to intoxication. So when we get those videos from the bars and on the video, you see the person our defendants arguing with. And if we can identify them and figure out who that person is, it's another witness that we can bring in. Um, bartenders doorman at the bars, things like that. When somebody gets kicked out, 
we want to identify those people that actually kicked him out and we can bring them in. They're going to be some of the best witnesses that we have to talk about this guy's intoxication. So <clears throat> how much evidence do I really need? So this is a question we get all the time. And I've actually heard some of our officers say it. Well, I've got this, I've got this, I've got this. How much do I really need? You can never have enough evidence on an intox manslaughter case. Um, you know, some of the cases that we've had, uh, Officer Kevin Will, who was killed back in 2011, we had boxes and boxes and boxes uh, of evidence that we brought in. And we were still looking for more right up to the day of trial. There is never enough evidence. And I'm sure any prosecutor will will tell you that and certainly agree with it. They always want more, let's get it for them. Um, so as we go through and we start talking about some of the tests, I'm not gonna get into all the field sobriety tests here, um, but there are a couple of things. One of them is, is HGN. Um, so it, it's always been the most reliable standardized field sobriety tests. I realize there are some states that are not allowed to discuss HGN, they don't even do HGN. Um, and it's really built around bad case law. And that's because uh, as officers, we end up giving bad testimony. Um, but some of the important things we got to remember only three of the seven drug categories are going to cause HGN. So um, one of the issues and hurdles that we have to jump over a lot of times with our officers is, well, I don't see HGN, he can't be impaired. Well, meanwhile, the guy can't stand up, can't talk, can't do anything else. We need to keep going past it and not worry about just HGN. Um, it's so important that it's always done correctly. And it's important that you follow it up with uh, by doing a vertical gaze nystagmus. Uh, in Texas, we can't talk about BGN, but if you don't do it, they're going to end up tossing your, uh, your HGN out. And that's just one of the tricks the defense attorneys have come up with. Um, if you mention it, they try to get the whole thing thrown out. If you don't do it, they get the whole thing thrown out. Uh, you're kind of in a catch-22 there. So just follow our training and, and do the test the whole way. Um, and then most importantly, and this leads up with the prosecutors as well, the officers have to know how to testify about HGN. So when you've got that rookie cop that's going to go up there and testify, number one, please ask for help before uh, you're going to go testify on that case. But hopefully the prosecutor is going to know that it's your first or second time testifying and they're going to treat you with a little bit better kid gloves than, than the 20 year vet that's done this a billion times and make sure that you're going to get the right questions. You're going to get the right info. Um, you know, and when we talk about HGN and these days with body worn cameras and everything else, everything wants to be recorded and we want to see it recorded. But with HGN, it wouldn't even be better if it's recorded. Well, absolutely it would. Um, we got these cameras a few years back. It's called the DAX Evidence Recorder. Um, we actually have 25 of these cameras. So they've been issued to our DREs when we go out on fatal crash scenes, when we do uh, DRE evaluations, we're recording HGN on our suspects. Uh, this has been an unbelievable tool for us when it comes to our impaired driving enforcement and when it comes to our cases and trial. Um, and I know because we're short on time, I'm not gonna play the whole video here, um, but this kind of evidence is, is amazing to take into a jury. We're not just showing a demonstrative video of what HGN might look like on a suspect, we're showing this actual suspect and what their HGN looks like on that night, after that crash, after they killed somebody. The woman in this video was a uh, Harris County probation officer. Uh, she was a 0.11. She also had cocaine and weed in her, um, and she killed somebody on a bicycle um, driving down a road. So um, one of the questions I always get when I talk about the DAX, and I sure wish I got paid by them to, to talk about it, but I think it's a great tool, is, you know, this is great for a station, but you can't use it on the street. You absolutely can use it on the street. So this is actually a screenshot from my body-worn camera where I'm holding the DAX um, in my left hand, you can see the Papa's restaurant in the background. Um, this suspect actually drove into that Papa's restaurant after she ran over a hooker on the street and broke her legs. Um, she was charged with intox assault, but you can see just on the screen on the DAX there, um, how clear this is, how great it works um, out there on the street. It works anywhere. Um, so if you're able to get a hold of it, it's not cheap. But if you can convince your department uh, or your DA's office to spend some funds and get one of these, it's an amazing tool for you to have. I would highly, highly recommend everybody having these. Um, and again, with HGN. So um, this is a picture I show all the time. Uh, this is a, the suspect that killed Officer Will back in 2011. And 
when we're doing our classes and we're talking to our young officers about when you can and can't do HGN, we'll put this picture up. And I always say, can you do HGN on this guy? 90% of the class is going to throw their hand up and say, no, absolutely do the HGN test. If they can open their eyes, if they've got equal pupil size, if they've got equal tracking, do the test. Let the lawyers argue about the head injury later, but do the test anyway. As long as they meet the criteria, don't let the head injury itself keep you from doing the test. Do it. Let the lawyers argue about it later. That's what they get paid all that money for. All right. So when we talk about DRE reconstruction, uh, this is a definition that, uh, that I got a few years back when during one of our research, we talked about reconstruction. This actually came from Tom Page, who's uh, one of the originators in the DRE program. Um, anybody that's a DRE or the DRE Facebook groups, so I'm sure knows who Tom is. Uh, but it's really the post-incident process of collecting, analyzing, interpreting evidence um, in order to reconstruct that person's state of sobriety at the time of the incident. Um, so we're collecting as much stuff as we can, as much information as we can get a hold of to try to make a determination um, after the fact. And it's not always easy to do. We're not always able to do it. Um, so for us, it's really just for the fatal crashes because we have so many that we end up having to go through. Uh, I'll get a phone call probably once uh, every two or three weeks from a misdemeanor prosecutor. Hey, we've got this case that's going to go to trial. Can you do a DRE re reconstruction on it? Um, there's no crash involved. There's no nothing else. It was just really kind of a crappy investigation. And I'm like, well, when do you need this by? Well, we need it by three o'clock this afternoon. It's not going to happen. Um, they get upset about it, but that's just reality. Um, we want our most experienced DREs to be involved in these. I bring our younger guys in to help out, mainly to help them get that experience. Uh, but this is not something you want to take your guy that just certified in the DRE program two weeks ago and say, here, do this reconstruction, put it together. They're not really going to have the skill set or the knowledge behind it to do it. Um, so when that investigation is lacking or it's incomplete or for whatever reason things didn't get done from the start, that's where the DRE reconstruction is going to end up coming into play and help you put your case back together. It's really going to link all that evidence back together. So uh, think about what the crash reconstruction itself does. The DRE reconstruction is the same thing, but we're using our suspect as the, as the piece that we're trying to put back together as opposed to the cars um, and the roadway. So Sarah Brannon is a, was a big case for us here in Texas. Uh, so the case that happened here in Houston uh, back in 2013, she was a wrong way driver on US 59 right by downtown, actually right next to Minute Maid Park and the uh, convention center. And she was driving a wrong way on a freeway at 60 miles an hour when she struck and killed a woman named Cynthia Hunter. Um, <clears throat> Cynthia was killed right away. Sarah Brandon was critically injured and not expected to survive. So the paramedics on scene are basically saying, look, she's, she's dead. She's not going to make it. Um, but she left. So that's kind of always the thing that happens, right? You're like, oh, everybody's gone. Nobody's going to make it. And then all of a sudden you figure out that your wrong way driver, your at fault driver um, ends up making it. So what do we do now? Well, luckily for us, uh, we've got a number of DREs on the department. So for the prosecutors, I would say find a DRE and start sucking up right away. Um, in this case, it was me. I was the one that got called, um, being our instructor here, and asked me to start looking at this case and try to put it together. So collect the offense reports, photos, the talks, the crash reconstruction, any video, any statements, medical records, basically anything else you can get your hands on. Uh, so when we do the, one of these reconstructions, we need to see the entire case. Um, so if the crash reconstruction hasn't been done, you can't do your DRE reconstruction. Um, if the tox results are not in, you can't do it. If you don't have medical records and your suspect was spent time in a hospital because of serious injuries, you can't do it. You need to have all these pieces uh, in place and given to you to be able to do it. So, and I always tell the prosecutors, don't expect miracles. If there's no evidence, there's no reconstruction. Um, just like a, a crash reconstruction, if there's no skid marks, there's no gouges, there's no marks in a roadway, there's no evidence left for the vehicles, um, all these different things, there's not gonna be a reconstruction. You've gotta have the pieces to put it together. Um, and it's not gonna be a rush job, so you have to give it time. Uh, anytime a prosecutor says, hey, I need this by tomorrow, the answer is always gonna be no. It's just, it cannot be done. 
um, a case like Sarah Brandon, I think we had something like 10,000 pages of medical records um, to go through. And uh, I wish that when we get these charts and we get all these medical records, everything was always in chronological order. So you could just start at the beginning and say, all right, well, she got admitted at this time. Here's what happened, A, B, C, and D, but they, it never seems to work that way. Everything's kind of mixed in. So you're, you're digging through piles and piles and piles trying to find stuff, uh, which is never easy. So what we end up finding out through, we actually had one of our DREs was on the scene of this crash and he was about the only person out there that said, you know what, I'm gonna go get blood drawn on this girl anyway, just to be on the safe side. Um, luckily he did. Um, so a combination of looking at, at our legal blood draw that was done, as well as the hospital blood draw, we found out she had six different drugs in her system uh, for four different drug categories uh, at the time of the crash. One of the things you end up having to do is, you know, the, the hospital blood is usually what's drawn before they do any treatment, before anything gets done, before they push any kind of meds. By the time our legal blood draw is done, um, especially on these more serious cases with the more serious injuries, they've already had some kind of pain uh, meds that have been pushed. There may be something else that's been put in there. So you really have to compare the two blood draws, compare what comes back in each blood draw, and then go through the medical records themselves to figure out what the hospital gave the person and what the person took themselves. Um, some of them are pretty easy. She had meth in her system. We're pretty sure Memorial Hermann uh, doesn't give people meth. She had weed in her. Uh, it's another one that, that's not given out here. Um, but some of the other stuff in her system, we had to really dig through and figure out, did she take this or did the hospital give it to her? Um, and you'll actually start canceling out some of the things that you'll see in a tox. Even after doing all that, she still had six drugs in her system. Uh, so she pled guilty and through a pre-sentence investigation, it was a hearing that was held back in November of 2015. Um, and this is where the big bonus for our DRE program in Texas ended up coming. Um, so she sent us to 12 years in TDC. And I remember talking to the defense attorney, who's a friend of mine. As soon as we finished all the testimony, the judge says, hey, I'm going to take 30 days and I'll give you an answer then. And I talked to the attorney. I said, I said she's getting probation. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. Uh, she'll get probation. The judge is going to feel sorry for her. She's crying and all the other stuff that usually goes on. Um, and then she gets 12 years. So the judge went through and cited the DRE reconstruction multiple times um, in his ruling. And that was the reason that he was handing out the sentence that he was. So had we not done all that work and done all that stuff for that DRE reconstruction, number one, she may not have gotten even charged, much less convicted, and certainly would not have got that 12 years in, uh, in, in TDC uh, to go with it. So this was a huge win for us and a huge win for the program uh, when it came down to it. Uh, Blaine Boudreau uh, is a, a whole nother animal to have to deal with. And I've talked about Boudreau in some other presentations that I've done. Um, his crash was back in 2015, and he was involved in four crashes over a two and a half hour period. Um, you know, every time we talk about this, that always surprises people. What surprised people even more is that two of them were fatal crashes. So two separate fatal crashes in a two and a half hour period. Um, Boudreau was a he was a, a special case, I guess would be one way to put it, but this is a video of him actually leaving his apartment uh, just before the first crash happened. So as part of putting this case back together, um, we just had to do so much digging. And in part because we really didn't know about a lot of it uh, in the very beginning. So we knew about the last crash that happened because he's arrested and charged. But then as we start digging through, we start finding things we find out about crash number one, uh, which happened at about 3.30 in the afternoon. The reason we found out about this crash is because he had a traffic ticket that was in his vehicle uh, at the time of that fatal crash. So it's kind of every officer's nightmare. It's the thing we talk about with cadets. It's the thing we talk about to people in the academy um, and even through in-service training. And it's always, you know, hey, don't be that guy that writes a, an impaired driver a ticket and then the guy gets in a crash and kills somebody later on. And that's exactly what happened here. So when we find that ticket, we've got to go back and start digging. So we find video uh, from the Metro rail that runs downtown Houston in the medical area. And we've got the video of Boudreaux as he's driving down Main Street. He's driving towards Texas Children's Hospital. And we see every red light that he runs. 
We see all the times he can't maintain a single lane of traffic, almost strikes other vehicles. Uh, we see him passed out at uh, green lights before he wakes up and goes through red lights. And that's exactly how he ends up having his first crash when he strikes a vehicle that stopped a red light. So an officer is with him out there for about an hour. Boudreaux actually makes the 911 call. So we have his recorded voice on that 911 call um, and know what he sounds like out there on that scene. Uh, this is a copy of the ticket that was issued to him. All right, and then crash number two happens at about five o'clock. So the first one at 3.35, he's there for about an hour. So roughly 20, 25 minutes later, after he's released, he's involved in a second crash. Uh, we have video of that crash as well. And when you watch the two videos, it's almost like you're watching the same crash from a different angle. So witness statements from both crashes are almost exactly the same. Um, passed out at, uh, with the green light, somebody's honking horns, wakes him up, he ends up blowing red lights before he finally crashes. Um, one of the big differences on, on the second crash is that there was a witness out there, and I'll, I'll never forget talking to this girl. She was a 19-year-old girl. Uh, she's a student. She worked in a bike shop. And the description that she gave about Boudreaux being intoxicated was almost like somebody took um, one of our DRE matrix cards and was reading off of it to describe all the indicators of intoxication that she, she saw with him. Um, now, my first interview with her was a couple days later, but I had a video that she made on her phone saying all these things. So it's not like she went and looked stuff up a couple days later or, or something else. These are observations she made at the scene that day. Um, we had a, an officer ends up making a scene. He ends up taking, when I say no action, he didn't even get out of his car, ends up driving away from that scene. Boudreaux ends up jumping back in his truck and he takes off. So once he takes off, he's involved in a third crash, which is a fatal hit and run uh, over in Southeast Houston, down near University of Houston. And then just a, a short time later, probably within a matter of minutes, he's involved in a fourth crash where he runs a red light and he kills a six-year-old child. Uh, after that crash, he's arrested and he ends up being charged with intox manslaughter. And that's really kind of where, where the ball starts rolling with everything. Um, so this is a vehicle that he struck in that final crash. This is a picture of Boudreaux's truck. And if you notice on the side of the vehicle, um, right where the two doors meet, it looks like there's uh, some handprints or something kind of rubbed off. Now it was starting to rain out here. This was a Sunday afternoon. So the way the officers on the scene are looking at it is, hey, we've got this bad crash out here. It's obvious what happened. There's a ton of witnesses that give the same descriptions as the first two crashes. Um, they watch him run a red light. There's no question about what happened as far as all the witnesses are concerned. So once the rain starts, some of the investigation stops and vehicles end up getting towed off. Well, the next day I go out and I take pictures and this is at our impound lot. So you can see on the side of his vehicle, there's some additional damage where it looks like there's some scrapes uh, on that passenger uh, back door on the back of the vehicle, there's some scrapes. But if you look right next to where it says Ram 150 and all those spots on there, those weren't noticed the day before in the crash scene. And what those spots are is tissue um, and, and body, it's body tissue from the hit and run crash that happened a few minutes before. Um, we didn't know about the hit and run crash until a full 24 hours after it happened. Um, we finished taking these pictures. We go back over to the DA's office. We're talking with the prosecutors and we get a phone call saying, hey, we've got a hit and run fatality out here and it's the same vehicle that uh, was involved in a crash yesterday. Um, of course, we knew that vehicle couldn't have been out there because we have it at our impound. We go out, the license plate from the truck is actually out there. There's an imprint from the license plate that's actually in the complainant's body. Um, so there's no doubt that it matches up. DNA ends up matching up as far as what's on the vehicle. Um, and then it was really a matter of trying to piece everything together and figure out exactly which crash happened at, at what time and in what order um, to really show the chain of events. So um, those four crashes, having a video, everything else is what really helps us develop our timeline uh, on this case to get it put together. The witness statements, Boudreaux's recorded voice was very important on that 911 call, the crash video, the tox report, um, all those different pieces when they come into play. 
And we actually went back and we filed DWI cases on those first two crashes where our officers failed to act and, and, and failed to take action. Um, with the felony cases, the misdemeanor cases weren't really that important, but we thought it was proper to go back and actually file those charges that, that should have been filed to start with. Um, the reconstruction additionally helps us file. We ended up with uh, two intox manslaughters and intoxication assault, failed to stop and render aid causing deaths along with the two DWIs. Um, so Boudreaux's in jail. I think he had about a $500,000 bond and we talked to his attorney and let him know, hey, there's additional charges coming. You might not want to bond him out just yet. Um, what we were working on was his prescription history. And I would encourage everybody, if you've got a fatal crash case, uh, serious bodily injury case, and it involves any kind of drugs, medications, anything else, go back and check the prescription history. Uh, this is a database through the state of Texas. Uh, uh, it's all run through DPS here with us. Um, but this is something that the pharmacists and the doctors are required to submit things into. So hydrocodone and some of those other drugs that are uh, super addictive and people are always out there trying to get, they've got to report when they write these scripts. The pharmacies have to report when they fill these scripts. Uh, as a patient, you actually have to sign a document saying that you're not being treated by another physician right now and you haven't been given these same drugs. Um, so it ends up being, being really important for us. So um, when you look on here, um, just the top one, so on 9-17-12, he gets a script for hydrocodone um, from a doctor over on Bissonette, and he fills it at the CVS on Bissonette. Well, on that same date, he sees another doctor at a different location, and the following day, he goes and gets the script filled at some place miles away because he kind of knows what the system is. So we actually subpoenaed 27 different doctors. Um, we get all these medical records, we get all this info, and then we went and filed an additional case of fraudulent prescription um, abuse and obtaining uh, the fraudulent uh, prescriptions. Um, all right, so uh, this is a picture that I took when we actually went and arrested him uh, for the prescription fraud. And uh, this ended up being a big piece for us as well, not just because of the additional charge, but you know, when, when Boudreaux was arrested, obviously he's impaired. When he makes the 911 call, he's impaired. Um, so our scene videos, our 911 call, all the contact that our officers had had with him, he's impaired, he's severely impaired. So this was a great opportunity to just have a conversation with him. We didn't talk about the case. We didn't, I didn't question him. He told me right from the start, I'm not talking about anything. So it was great. So we just made conversation. Um, we actually went to the hospital where his son was and arrested him there um, and talked about all kinds of things except the case. And the whole reason for it was I wanted recordings of what Boudreaux sounded like when he's sober. And we knew he was sober because he was, he was taking drug tests a couple of times a week. Uh, he had a at home and talk slider he was blown into. So we know he didn't have anything in him. Um, but that was another piece that we could end up using uh, later on in the trial. So his tox results, when they came back, he had Xanax, which he had no prescriptions for, um, and Adderall, which he had multiple scripts for, uh, for multiple doctors. And then we're set for trial on this case in September of 2018. And we took all those charges that we had, and we actually reduced all that down to one charge of felony murder. Um, and in Texas, we make felony murder because he's in the commission of a felony when he causes the death of another person. So we use the uh, the fatal hit and run case is our underlying felony, which is the first time that that had been done in the state. Um, and then obviously the crash that killed six-year-old Josh Madrano um, was, the, was the death that occurred. Uh, so it was some hurdles to get over, um, but it certainly worked out and, and we ended up with a great outcome in this case when you look big picture. <clears throat> so this was a, uh, one of the clippings from the next day. So Boudreaux got 80 years. Um, uh, for all these crashes and for these deaths and everything else that occurred that day. And, you know, when you look at it and everybody says, man, 80 years, that's great. It's, it's a great sentence. Uh, some people thought he should have got more. Um, 80 years, essentially, in the state of Texas is a life sentence anyway. He'll do at least half of that before he's even eligible for parole. Um, so he's going to be in his late 70s before he's he's even eligible to have a hearing to, to try to get out. Um, 
you know, but when we talk about this stuff and we look at this case and we look at the outcome that should have happened, uh, when I bring it up to people, the outcome that should have happened in this case was Boudreaux should have been charged with a first offense DWI and he should have been looking at a maximum of six months in a county jail or a probation case. It never should have got to the point where it was. Um, now, you know, when we look at the reconstruction side of it, this case is phenomenal for us and the, all the work that went into it, some of the new things that we did never should have got to that point. Um, and people get upset when I talk about it. Officers on our department get upset because they know I talk about this case, but we screwed up. Um, and this case should not have gone the way that it did. We should have certainly handled this a whole lot different. Um, so when we talk about uh, some of the additional stuff that we want to collect, so everything is evidence. Everything is, is going to go into your case. So start looking at receipts. So when you're searching that suspect after the arrest and you're pulling the receipts out of his pocket, take a look at them. If there's got a signature on it, hang on to those receipts, tag them as property. Um, they're going to be evidence for later on. And then when you start looking at other things that might be in his vehicle, um, you know, some kind of document that he signed, compare the signatures. Um, if he's coming into court because he's been charged with, you know, with this fatal crash or, or whatever it is you have, and he's going to sign the court reset slips to promise that he's going to appear back in court again, compare that signature with what you have on the receipt. You're going to see a huge difference between the sober signature and the intoxicated signature. It's just one more little piece that you can you can end up putting in. So uh, when I talked about some of the video stuff earlier, so a case like Lauren Zeller's is a is a great one. Whoops, for us to talk about. So um, he's leaving a topless bar. He's in a, a rear end collision. He hits a vehicle, causes it to roll over. It kills an 18 year old girl. So stuff that we found from collecting video is number one, the, for whatever reason, the, the topless bars in Houston seem to have the absolute best video surveillance uh, of any places that we find. So we find things like this where Zellers comes in and the first thing he does, he goes back to the bar, he shakes the bartender's hand. So that's gonna indicate to us that he knows that bartender. Um, there are plenty of bars that, that I've been to. Um, I don't go in and shake the bartender's hand even before all this COVID garbage. Um, you just don't, unless you know the guy. Well, when you know the bartender, you know that you're going to get drinks that are a little bit stronger. Um, so it's just some of those little things that start start adding up. Um, this is video of the parking lot as Zellers is leaving. So we see him walk out. He goes across the parking lot. And then he takes a little tumble here. So he's rolling around on the ground out there and jumps back in his car and he ends up leaving. He's getting into the yellow pickup. Um, that's right next to where he falls down at uh, to when he stumbles over there to it. So this is another uh, screenshot from video as he's driving out. Notice he's got no headlights on. Um, the vehicle that or the uh, building you see in the background, he actually struck the building and broke one of his taillights out uh, as well when he pulled out from that parking spot. So the video can do great things for us. So some of the things that we end up learning uh, from him and from this video, whoops, is that, you know, he knows a bartender, he's going to get the stronger drinks, hits a building, you know, leaves with his lights off. So all these additional things um, end up coming up. So Zellers is convicted, the jury actually gives him probation. Um, he gets six months in the county jail as a condition. And just after he gets out, uh, I'm actually refereeing a hockey game uh, at one of our rinks here. And I see him sitting off the, off the side of the rink watching. The, this is a beer league hockey game that he's out there watching. Um, so one, I'm like, I know this guy from somewhere. And then I start thinking, wait a minute, he's not supposed to be someplace where alcohol is being served. So uh, during, you know, between the, I can't remember if it was the first and second or second and third period, I, I walk out there to the area and I'm say, hey, aren't you Lawrence Ellers? And he gets all excited because somebody knows him. He's like, hey, where do I know you from? said, oh, I'm one of the officers that testified in your trial. And of course, then he looks like he's just going to pass out and he ends up running off and, um, and everything else. So you, you never know where you're going to see people at or where you're going to end up remembering something from somebody. Um, so Erasmo Ramirez, this is another case where the video uh, ends up being really important for us. Uh, Erasmo rear ends a vehicle uh, on a highway doing 130 miles an hour, kills an 18-year-old girl named Emily Jones, um, and he was a 0.26. So Erasmo was also at a topless bar um, here in town called Rick's Cabaret. 
So uh, again, so great, great video from these places from a standpoint of collecting evidence. So <clears throat> we get the video of Erasmo walking in. Um, we have video of Erasmo walking out. We have um, find out as $2 Tuesdays. So he goes in there to Jeep drink cheap and he wants to drink a lot. So some of the stuff we find out from him, so obviously with the drink special, um, by going through that video, we know that he was in there for four and a half hours drinking that bar part of the crash. We know that he had at least 12 beers and five shots while he was in there because with that video, we can actually count every time a drink is brought to him. Um, there are a couple of spots within uh, the bar that there's no video. So obviously we can't pick that stuff up, uh, but from what we can see, we know it's at least 12 beers and five shots. Um, we know from the video, he likes to get lap dances. We know he doesn't like to pay for lap dances. Um, and then he gets thrown out of the club. And when he gets thrown out, that's when he jumps out and he's flying down the freeway um, and causes that crash. So this is girl that he killed, Emily Jones. This is her vehicle. So she's driving this, this big pickup truck that he ends up plowing into. And that's a speedometer out of his vehicle. So he's doing... Uh, 130 miles an hour uh, when he plows into her. So social media, social media is another big thing. So I'm, I'm on Facebook and Twitter and, and all that stuff. And I probably say a lot of dumb things I shouldn't say. Um, but the reality is people will post a lot of stuff on social media. So pictures of their drinks, pictures of where they're going out to, pictures of the food that they're having. Um, the photos on here, the guy in the flower shirt, that's the guy I was talking about uh, that were for Aramark and it was at Minute Maid Park. So we use these photos that were taken off his cell phone and off his girlfriend's cell phone. These were evidence in court. So when he said, oh, I only had one or two draft beers. Well, we know from these photos, he's having more than draft beers. Um, so the pictures are so important. So, you know, take their cell phones, tag them, get a search warrant, download the contents of that cell phone. Um, and then please take pictures of your defendants. So this is not one of my pictures. Um, but I saw it a year or so ago, thought it was kind of funny with the Drunk Lives Matter on there. Um, wristbands that, that people are wearing when they leave the clubs, it's going to help us identify what club they were at. Some of them are very unique. One of the things we're finding here now is that we're actually getting our DWI defense attorneys are starting to advertise on the wristbands from the clubs. So it'll have the name of the club and it'll say Tyler Flood, DWI defense attorney, do not blow.com. Uh, or something like that, but it helps us identify where that person was, where they drank at. Uh, a picture like this one, this girl was involved in an intox manslaughter case. And you know, when she shows up for court and we show up for trial, she's not wearing a shirt like this one. She's going to be in a suit. She's going to have makeup on. She's going to have her hair done, everything else. This is who she really is. This is the party girl that's going out. It's not going to be the one who's dressed up and wants everybody to feel sorry for her. Um, so make sure you're taking pictures of, of your defendants out there. Um, this is a DWI defense attorney that, uh, that we arrested for DWI. So, um, this guy was so polluted, he couldn't even walk from my police car to get into the station. So we actually had to wheel one of our restraint chairs out, put him in the restraint chair and then wheel him into the station before we're going to, uh, try to do a breath test and eventually end up drawing his blood. Um, so, uh, my buddy, Sal Corral, he's the other one in the picture here. So we take this picture with him. This is actually my screensaver on my computer in the office and, and everything else. So I always encourage everybody, if you arrest a DWI defense attorney, you know, these guys do some pretty nasty stuff with us. Please take a picture of it and send it to me. I will be more than happy to put it in my presentations um, and show it all over the place. So the last thing I'll say, because I know we're getting short on time here, is always wear your vest, always wear your seatbelt. So no exceptions to that, no excuses at all. Um, it's something everybody has to do. It's going to save your life. Um, uh, just no other way to put it. So you, you've got to do it. Um, so if there's any questions, uh, I will be more than happy to try to answer any questions if anybody has. Um, and that's it. I think I've actually come in uh, just under time with a little bit of room for some questions.
Uh, let's see. So I got one question here. If a defendant's wearing a shirt with an incriminated statement on the shirt, does that really factor in the case? Um, for the case itself, probably not. When we're talking about the guilt innocent phase of the case, uh, for punishment, uh, I think it absolutely can. And it's something that the juries will end up looking at mainly because, um, what you end up having is instead of the party girl look, you've got somebody, you know, dressed up or somebody wearing some other goofy shirt. Um, I mean, they know what they're putting on when they go out. So it certainly will factor in when you start talking about punishment and what kind of person this is and what kind of history they have um, and everything else. So it can certainly end up factoring in. Uh, but again, it kind of goes back to every little piece that you can end up getting. Um, mm -hmm. it, may, it may help, it may not help, but why not just collect it all anyway and let's go from there. Um, let's see, do I think more people are driving around and drinking since the bars are closed or at limited capacity? Um, you know, that's, that's a tough one to answer. Um, uh, I know here in Texas, um, the bars technically have been closed. Uh, our governor just did an order a couple of weeks ago, allowing, uh, the bars to reopen, but what they've done here actually. So, um, if they serve food, they've been allowed to reopen. So we have some of the bars that will open a hot dog stand uh, within the bar or right outside it or attached to it. Well, now they're a restaurant and they're not just a bar. Um, so they've kind of gotten around that. So the, realistically, our bars have been open. Um, what's surprising though, is it having the ballpark, um, you know, Minute Maid Park and a couple other places that um, have been closed. We have a lot of DWIs that come out of the ballpark. They come out of Toyota center. They come out of, um, uh, energy stadium. So even with all those events shut down, no concerts, all those other things, we're still seeing a ton of DWIs. Um, last year we did a record number for us. We did just about 9,000 DWI cases for the city. We're only about 300 behind that so far this year. Um, so we're not really seeing a big difference in them. Uh, have I run into any issues in court with the DAX camera? No, um, absolutely not. So the thing to remember with the DAX, um, it's not a new piece of technology. It's not new equipment. It's just a camera. It's no different than if I pull off my body worn camera and I was going to hold it up in front of their face, although the DAX gets a much better picture. Um, so that's the biggest thing with it to remember. It's, it's just a camera. You're just holding a camera up there to record. Um, if you try to sell it as anything else, maybe that's where things kind of come into play. Um, we have had some cases that have gone up on appeal, um, here in Texas, and they've come down confirmed from a court of appeals that the DAX is not new technology. It's, it, it's a camera. So, um, you know, I mean, hell your cell phone camera could work for it as well, but you don't really want to use your cell phone for something like that in court. Um, and then can defendants refuse to be recorded with the DAX? Absolutely. They can. Um, one of the things to remember with the DAX is they cost just about five grand for each one. So when I have a suspect who's on PCP, who's combative, uh, if I have a suspect who's just on alcohol and is just really pissed off and, and wants to fight, we're not going to end up using the DAX. Um, I don't want to take a chance of losing a $5,000 piece of equipment, uh, for that drunk. I'll just explain in my report and in court that, Hey, I tried to use it and the guy wouldn't cooperate and, and didn't want to play along. Um, so something else that we can use again, so with not wanting to cooperate, but we don't have the evidence to go with it either. All right. That looks like it was our last question. Uh, thank you very much for all the questions that uh, came in. And thank you, Sergeant Eggdor, for your time. Uh, well, thanks thank for you having me on. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, thank you to the viewers as well. We hope you learned something new and uh, we'll share your knowledge with your colleagues. A link to an evaluation can be found in the chat box and will also be emailed to you. Please take two minutes to fill out the survey. The leadership does read these um, and take them important or uh, they uh, find them very important and, and uh, we wish that you would uh, do that for us. We encourage you to follow the Minnesota TZD program on its social media. And lastly, we hope that you sign up for other webinars in our series. I encourage you to attend webinars outside of your E and share information about the upcoming webinars with your colleagues, friends, and family. The next webinar will be tomorrow at 1 p.m. It's not too late to register for this event. Laura Moore from the Kansas Traffic Safety Resource Office branch 
she will be discussing the SAFE program and ensuring teens know that seatbelts are for everyone. A full list listing of the webinar details can be found online. Remember that they are all free, but registration is required. The Minnesota TZD program would like to end with this message. Again, thank you everybody for, for joining us today and we hope it was beneficial.